Welcome back. This is Chem 103. We are in Chapter 5, which means that we are halfway through. Kind of unbelievable, I know. This is really a continuation of Chapter 4, where we talked about models of the atom. So if you had a difficult time with electron configurations and understanding the main energy levels and sublevels and orbitals, it would probably be a good idea to revisit Chapter 4, even if you don't do it right right now. But Chapter 5 will not make sense, at least not all of it, if you don't understand Chapter 4. It really does build. It's really like one big chapter. With that said, here we go. In Chapter 4, we started off with looking at, you know, notation and what is an element and that kind of stuff. Now we're talking about the classification of the elements and the history of the periodic table itself. There was a German chemist whose name I will absolutely butcher if I try. He observed that several elements could be classified in groups of three. They had similar chemical properties and they showed trends in the physical properties. You should remember chemical and physical properties from chapter three. He called these groups of three triads. A bit later, someone else suggested, maybe we should arrange these elements into groups of seven according to increasing atomic mass. Remember atomic mass, again from chapter four, is just how much an atom of that element weighs. And we use atomic mass units to describe atomic mass. So we said, okay, start with the smallest, and then we keep building until we get to the biggest. And there were only 60, 62 known elements at the time. His theory was called the law of octaves. And so he proposed that if you had seven elements, you arrange them in increasing atomic mass, that eighth element is going to repeat the elements of the first group. So if I had element A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, that's seven elements, right? Element H, I would put in the first column underneath A. And these two would have similar properties. That's what's meant by the law of octaves. Mendeleev, however, said, okay, that's great, but here's a different idea. Let's arrange these in order of increasing atomic mass. And we're going to organize by the formula of the element's oxide. So that was really the big key to the difference between the Mendeleev periodic table and all the others, is the formula of the element's oxide. And what does that mean? What that means is when you form an oxide, you have a metal with oxygen. And the number of metal atoms that you have in the compound differs depending on um, the specific chemical properties of that metal. For example, in the first group, Mendeleev put R2O. R is just equal to your given element. So just think of it as like, you know, the X in any kind of math equation, right? So R is just an element. All of the elements that form an oxide with this particular formula, R2O, like hydrogen would be H2O, we know that is water. Lithium is Li2O, okay? All of that is in the first group. So he organized all of the elements that were known based on how they form a compound with oxygen. Notice that there are some spaces here. 
And there's also these Ika with a dash. Mendeleev was able to predict the existence of certain elements that were not yet found. And he is thought to be the architect of the modern periodic table. So as I talked about just before, Mendeleev was able to not just notice, hey, you know, there might be some elements missing from this table, but he was also able to predict some of the properties of the unknown elements just based on the arrangement in which group the unknown elements fell into. So for example, He made a prediction, which he named it Eka Silicon. Okay. The actual name now is Germanium. But he predicted all of these different attributes. The color, the atomic mass, the density, melting point. All of this information he just predicted based on how he organized all the elements. So this was obviously a really good idea because the trends held pretty well. The periodic table was expanded by one group with the discovery of argon. Argon is a noble gas. And so several others were discovered, helium, neon, krypton, etc. They were discovered in the next several years after the initial discovery of argon. They were first called inert gases because it was believed that you could never do any chemistry with these gases. But then xenon and krypton were used to make different compounds starting in the 60s. So we use noble gases as the term to describe all of those elements in that last group that was discovered at the far right of the periodic table. H.G.J. Mosley discovered that the nuclear charge, so what that means is the number of protons, right, increased by one for each element on the periodic table. So he said instead of arranging by the formula of the oxide, Let's arrange the elements in increasing nuclear charge. That's going to better organize the periodic table and have the trends on the periodic table be better explained. Periodic law states that the properties of elements recur in a repeating pattern when arranged according to increasing atomic number. Make sure that you know that, the periodic law. Increasing atomic number gives you repeating patterns of properties in the, in the elements. Take that concept along with the concept of the energy levels that we talked about in chapter four with the Bohr model of the atom those two things together came and made the periodic table that we see today in its current arrangement. Let's talk more about the organization of the periodic table. We've got groups and we've got periods. I'm going to switch to my highlighter tool. Groups are vertical columns. They have, the elements in there have similar, similar chemical properties. You'll also see them refer to, referred to as families. My tongue is tied up, y'all. Release it. Periods, however, are the horizontal rows. They show a range of different properties. There's no real rhyme or reason they just happen to be in the same energy level. All right, how do I remember this? Because you need to know what, what's groups, what's periods. I write group, 
vertically like a column. And then I write period using the P from group. This little mnemonic, this little image helps keep it straight in my head. A group is a column, a period is a row. The groupings of the elements on the periodic table, you'll need to know these. I have some slides to talk about each group, but this is a good summary. You'll need to know the common names for some of the representative elements, and I'll talk about what representative means in a minute. You'll need to know some of the characteristics, just a little bit, okay? You'll need to recognize this little table underneath here, the lanthanide series and actinide series, which is which, so that you can locate elements. If I tell you this element is in group 5A and it has, you know, this trait, you need to be able to find it, okay? So here's some more vocabulary for you. We've got representative elements, which are the main group elements. They have an A after them. So 1A, 2A, okay? And there's that all the way up to 8A. 8A being the noble gases. Then there's the transition elements. Those are all the Bs. If you remember from chapter four, where we were talking about the different blocks on the periodic table, that's the D block. All the elements in that D block are transition elements. They're in the B group. The inner transition elements are found below that main table. They're also called rare earth elements. And you can divide that further into the lanthanide series and the actinide series. The inner transition elements, that's our F block. Just for completion, 1A and 2A, that's the S block. And then 3A through 8A is the P block. So just to give you some grounding and try to relate all of these different ways that we're referring to the same sections of the periodic table, it would be wise to have a periodic table with all of these common names that I'm going to show you, the representative elements, transition elements, and all those kinds of things. So you can put it in your head and you can compare, okay, S block, that's this. P block, this is also representative elements. Tra the D block, those are the transition elements. Put the pieces together, especially for the exam that covers chapter five. You'll need to take all of your chapter four knowledge and apply it. Make sure that you make some kind of cheat sheet, study guide, what have you, that takes all of that information from those chapters and puts them together. Because you will see it together on the exam and on your final because it's cumulative. These are the common names I was talking to you about. And so see how it says common names of families? Remember, that's the same thing as groups. So those vertical columns. We've got group one, which is the alkali metals. That's also known as 1A. Group two, the alkaline earth metals, also known as 2A. We've got group 17, that's the halogens, also 7A. And group 18, that's the noble gases, also labeled 8A. So you'll see that the groups are labeled 1 through 18, but then there's also the number followed by A or B. I'm trying to give you both here. 
So let's talk about the trends that occur on the periodic table when you arrange the elements based on increasing atomic number. The first one we'll cover is atomic radius. That literally means if we have an atom, the nucleus is in the center. Imagine that is actually the center because this is a terrible looking circle. The distance from that nucleus to the outermost energy level that it has filled is the atomic radius. As you go up a group, the atomic radius decreases. As you go from left to right, the radius decreases. If you have a periodic table that you can print out or write on with a tablet, add these trends to that periodic table. So you may end up with four periodic tables that are covered in notes. Laminate them, especially if you're gonna take more chemistry because they're gold. And it'll be great for you to study and you can reproduce that in your test taking environment for your exam. You're always going to get a periodic table for a chemistry exam. You can write on it with whatever you want. You can't bring your notes, but you can jot down some things from your brain. So I would recommend, in addition to studying, practice drawing your cheat sheet. It'll help you remember the trends so you don't have to look at them as often. But if in the test setting you get a little bit anxious, your brain just kind of fails you a little, you can at least have that, you know, kinetic, kinesthetic memory and you start writing things on that periodic table. It'll help jog your memory. And when you reference it, it'll help you get some more points. Back to the matter at hand, atomic radius. We said it decreases as you go from the bottom of a group to the top of a group and as you go from left to right across a period. Now this trend really only applies to the representative elements. The transition elements, we've got a lot of exceptions. Now why is this? Well remember from chapter four that each row is really an energy level. And the higher your N, the further away your electrons are. So all the way out here, you can have electrons in cesium, rubidium here. Right? We're looking at the outermost electrons. Well, if the symbol is the center, the nucleus, that distance is getting smaller as you go from higher energy to lower energy. So that atomic radius is going to shrink. You don't have as much distance between the, the nucleus and the electrons because the energy level is not that big. As you go from the left to the right, this is the same energy level with more electrons. So if we've got n equals 1 versus n equals 2, we're adding up more electrons to the same volume. And those electrons are going to have a greater attraction to the nucleus because electrons are positively charged. <laughs> 
let's try that again, electrons are negatively charged and they're attracted to protons, which are positively charged. That attraction helps to shrink the size of the atomic radius. And that's pretty much what's written on this slide in words. Some people like to see kind of a picture. Others like to have the words. Try to cater to everybody. So you can read this, you can write this in your notebook verbatim. It'll help you understand the trend of atomic radius and you can kind of reason it out as you're doing your homework and your quizzes and your exams. The next trait we'll talk about is metallic character. What that means is the degree of metallic character of an element. So how easily does an element give up electrons? And it's pretty much the same trend as atomic radius. So as you go up a group or across a period from left to right, metallic character decreases. This summarizes the two trends that we've talked about so far, atomic radius in blue and metallic character in red. We have a couple of more, one for sure trend, one that's kind of a trend but you don't really need to draw arrows for. So we'll be adding to this a little bit more. We're gonna jump back to talking about the elements themselves versus the trends. We've got these trends. We could talk about the properties of the elements like density and melting point that we can predict based on the elements around it. Let's say that we were looking at group 1A. That's the alkali metals, starting with lithium, going all the way down to cesium. There's another element in this group, francium. We can look at the atomic radius, the density, the melting point, atomic mass for all of these and make some predictions about what we think all of those values will be for francium. Now I can't give you a specific number but I know that I can look at the trend. Atomic radius, we see that the radius is getting bigger. So it should be bigger than 266 picometers for the atomic radius of francium. That's just what we were talking about, how the atomic radius increases as you go down a group or decreases as you go up. Whichever way you can remember it, that, that works. Now we've got density. Overall, we see that the density increases as you go down this group. So the guess here would be that the density is going to be greater than 1.87. So small irregularities like here where the, the sodium density is a little bit higher than potassium, that happens. But the overall trend is that density increases at least for this group, right? Melting point, we start with a high melting point and then it gets lower and lower and lower. Well, then our guess would be for francium that the melting point is going to be less than 28.4. And in this final column, we've got atomic mass. We know it should definitely increase because that's how the periodic table is arranged. If you're increasing in atomic number, then you're adding more and more protons and neutrons, which means that your atom is getting heavier and heavier. So it follows that francium, which is the last element in group 1A, should have 
the biggest atomic mass. It should be greater than 132.91, which is cesium. So that's how you can predict physical properties based on the elements around that given element. When we talk about chemical properties, they should all have similar chemical properties as well. All of the alkali metals have oxides with the general formula M2O. That should sound familiar because this is just like Mendeleev's periodic table. So all of the elements in group 1A, when they're in a compound with oxygen, you're going to find two of them, lithium 2, and then there's an oxygen, sodium 2. So don't forget, chemical properties, this is what we're talking about, the general formulas of how they combine with nonmetals, okay? So let's do a little practice. The formula for the chloride of calcium is CaCl2. What is the formula for the chloride of barium? What you need to do here is find barium on the periodic table. And when you do, you'll notice barium and calcium are in the same group. They're in group 2A. And since the formula for calcium chloride is CaCl2, then the formula for barium should be barium Cl2. I could give you any element in group 2A and ask you for the formula for the chloride of that element and you should be able to give it to me because they're all the same. This is just a reminder of the blocks of the elements. We covered this in chapter four and I'm gonna keep saying that because it's true. So if you don't, if this looks completely like a different language, like where are we getting these S's and D's from? Go back to chapter four please, because the rest of this will not make sense. If you don't already have a cheat sheet of the periodic table that has all of the energy levels, which that's what these are, and then all of the different sublevels, this is a good substitute. I like circling it and drawing it and writing it out and everything just because I learned better that way. But if you just want to print something out that is already done for you and you don't really care for my handwriting, it's okay. I'm a realist. Then this is a good one to print out. Now, why do we care? Because in chapter four, we talked about writing electron configurations. We wrote the full electron configurations for several elements. That's very valuable to understand, but there's a shorthand way of writing all that down. Now you need it to learn the full so you can understand the abbreviation. Let's do a review of the full configuration and then use that to jump to writing the noble gas or the abbreviated electron configuration. We're going to write an electron configuration for sodium, which is here. I'll write in all of our S's and P's. Then we literally walk across the periodic table. Always start with the one S. That orbital can hold two electrons. So we're done. We just handled that whole row. Then we jump down to n equals two. We fill the 2s. 
the S sublevel can only hold two electrons because there's only one orbital. And you see these dots, I'm marking where we are. So if I stopped here with writing my configuration, it would be the configuration for beryllium. But that's not sodium, so we've got to keep going. We hop on over to the P. We're at the 2P. There are three P orbitals, and each of them can hold two electrons. So that's six electrons total. And you can count them. One, two, three, four, five, six. If we stopped there, we would have neon, which is a noble gas. We need to get to sodium, so we've got to add one more electron, and that's in the 3s. We only need to add one, though, because that's where sodium is. That's the full configuration. With the noble gas, or the abbreviated configuration, you use a noble gas instead of all the stuff before that's full. So we've got all of this stuff, all of these sublevels that are full. We can rewrite that. I said before that that is the configuration for neon. So what if I took all of this and wrote it out like this? This means that the configuration for neon, the electron configuration for neon, that's what we have. And add to that one more electron. If we wanted to write the noble gas configuration straight up without writing out the full configuration first, here's what you do. I'm going to switch to a different color so you can see it better. We'll use purple. We've got sodium right here. It's in N equals 3. You find the noble gas in the energy level above your, your element. So we've got sodium it's in n equals 3 that means look at n equals 2 noble gases that's what ng is that's group 8a so you find that noble gas n equals 2 is up here the noble gas is here. For the configuration, you'll use that noble gas and then everything that comes after the noble gas, you write in. So that's that 3S1. We're going to do this more throughout this lecture because there's some other applications to using the noble gas electron configuration. It makes it a lot easier for some of the other topics we're going to cover in this chapter. Let's do another one. We're just going to write the noble gas configuration. Here's sulfur. 
sulfur is in N equals 3. Use the noble gas in N equals 2, which is the one above it. So we're still using neon, even though this is a different element. Now, we write everything in this third energy level because that's not covered. So all of the 3s and 3p electrons that sulfur has, we need to write out. There's two in the s block. 3s2 and then you count in the p's because that's where sulfur is 1 2 3 4 3 p 4 that is the noble gas configuration for sulfur why do we care about the noble gas configuration because it gives us an easier way to determine the valence electrons of an atom. The valence electrons are the ones that occupy the outermost principal energy level of an atom. Those are the electrons that are involved in chemistry. They do chemical reactions. Another way to remember that is that valence electrons are the S and P electrons beyond the noble gas core. We just did sodium and sulfur. They both have neon for their noble gas core, but sodium only has one additional electron. Sodium has six, or excuse me, sulfur has six additional. These are valence electrons. We don't have to go through and write the configuration to know how many valence electrons there are. If you use the Roman numeral in the American convention, which is the one that has the letter after it, for the representative elements, that's all you need. Group 1A, that's one valence electron. If you're in group 5A, that's five valence electrons. It's that simple, but it's got to be the number with the A behind it. So all the ones that I've circled, fair game. All the representative elements, you can look at the Roman numeral that comes before the A, and that'll tell you the number of valence electrons. We can write what's called an electron dot formula or a Lewis dot structure to visually represent the valence electrons of an element. So I'll draw kind of a generic one to show you how you draw it. You're first gonna write the symbol of the element. So I'll write SY as our example, okay? From one to four valence electrons, you're just gonna draw a dot on any side, right? You're gonna fill up to four. Don't pair up the electrons. If you've got four or fewer valence electrons, then they should have their own side, okay? They do not want to share. Just think about it. If you have family coming over, you've got cousins in your same age range. If there's an available place for them to sleep, sleep on the couch, there's an air mattress, somebody got an inflatable bed or something like that, or there's a spare room with, you know, a bed, you're not going to share your bed. You're going to say, nah, you go in there. You have your own space. I keep my space. However, 
times are tight or you got a lot of cousins ain't enough beds you're going to share and that's what happens when you get to five through eight you double up so if you share in that twin size mattress your head is next to somebody's feet and just like you the electrons don't want to do that so make sure if you've got four or fewer valence electrons that they each have their own side just for clarity again this is the symbol of the element and it represents all the core electrons we're drawing just the valence electrons which are the outermost electrons in that outermost principal energy level let's do a couple of examples the first one will draw a dot formula for phosphorus which is in group 5a that means it's got five valence electrons the symbol for phosphorus is a P. We're going to go around and fill up each one of our spots with one. That's only four. So you got to go back around and add another one for five. It doesn't matter where you have the pair of electrons. So you could write not the same exact one because that would be pointless right you can write the pair here or here all of those are correct as long as you have five electrons or five dots and you've only got one pair and the other three are singlets, you're good to go. Now let's try this for magnesium. Magnesium is in group 2A, so it's got two valence electrons. You write the symbol. There's only two, so each electron gets its own bed. Doesn't matter, there are four beds available, so you can put them in beds opposite each other right next to each other so they can share stories and giggle when they're supposed to be sleeping those are all correct why do we care about valence electrons we care about valence electrons because they are involved in chemistry and one of the ways that we can quantify what kind of chemistry an element is going to participate in is by looking at the ionization energy. The ionization energy of an atom is the amount of energy required to remove an electron in the gaseous state. And in general, the trend, so this is get out your periodic tables again, increases as you go from the bottom to the top of a group it also increases as you go from left to right across the periodic table for those of you who need to see that ionization energy increases as you go up a group or left to right across a period this is the prettified version but it doesn't have the um, atomic radius and the metallic character trends so that's why I am a huge proponent of having your own periodic table and putting all three of those trends on there and then circling the Roman numerals followed by the A 
for the representative elements for the valence electrons. That way you have all of the trends on one piece of paper. If you can remember that ionization energy is the one oddball of the three, then you'll be good to go when it comes time for homework and exams. We've covered valence electrons, which are the outermost ones that participate in chemistry. Ionization energy, which talks about how easily you can remove those electrons. Now we're talking about what happens when you do remove electrons. When you remove electrons, you form a positive ion. Most of the periodic table consists of metals and metals react by losing their valence electrons to form positive ions. Here's an example. We've got a, a lithium atom. This is its electron configuration. It's got the 1s sublevel full, 2s, we've got one electron. So this is the lithium nucleus. It'll have a couple of protons, which blue is always my protons. We'll use green for our neutrons. and we'll use red for our electrons. Stopped prematurely in my drawing here. Okay. So this is my rendition of a lithium atom. We've got our protons and neutrons in the nucleus, and we've got our electrons hanging out on the outside. When this lithium atom loses one of its electrons, it's going to lose its valence electrons. The valence are the ones that are the furthest out in the S and the P. So that's going to be these guys. There's only one in there. So if we lose that, what do we have left? Well, we didn't do anything to the protons, right? That's still the same. If we change the number of protons, then we've changed the element. We didn't do that. So the nucleus is still the same, even though it doesn't look the same in my drawing. I'm just a bad drawer, okay? But stick with me, kid. You'll go far. But we got rid of one electron. So now we're down to two electrons. Three protons means that's a positive three charge. Three electrons is a negative three. You total those up and you get zero, right? That's a neutral atom. We get rid of one of those. We've still got three protons for a plus three charge. We've got two electrons. That's a minus two charge. If you add those two together, 
you now have a positive one charge. This is the lithium ion. It's positively charged. So hopefully that visual of what's happening here will help you when it comes to looking at the electron configuration of the atom versus the ion. What we're leading to is eventually writing the configurations for ions. So here's another example. We've got sodium. These are the core electrons. And if we were to write this in noble gas configuration, like we did before. Remember, we can replace the core with neon and then write the valence electrons on the outside. What happens if we get rid of those valence electrons? We're left with the noble gas core electrons. Remember, this is for positive ions. So all of the metals, they lose their valence electrons to form positive ions. In general, when you look at a representative element that's a metal. The ionic charge is going to be equal to the group number. Sodium is in group 1A. That means that the sodium ion is going to be 1 plus. That means it loses one electron. If I had something in group 2A, like calcium, it would lose two electrons and it would have a two plus charge. Let me convince you of that. Let's write the configuration for the calcium ion. We'll start with writing the noble gas configuration for the calcium atom, okay? The atom, we're not addressing the ion right now. We're talking about a neutral atom. We said find your element of interest, that's calcium in N equals four. For the noble gas core, you're gonna go up to the energy level above, that's energy level three, and find the noble gas, that's argon. That's our core. Then you fill in all of the other electrons between that noble gas and your element. In this case, we've got the 4s, and there are two electrons there, okay? These electrons are the valence electrons. We're going to lose those. When we write out our configuration for the ion, We get rid of that, and we just have the core. 
since we lost two electrons and we're in group 2A, it's a calcium 2 plus ion. So the charge is equal to positive 2. We'll make sure to do plenty of this practice in class. So if you're like, man, I get it when you say it, but if you ask me to do this, I'd be like, mm -mm, that's okay. Make sure that you come to the live lecture and you get the practice and input that you need to get it on your own. We only addressed half the battle. We've now got to tackle non-metals. Most of the periodic table is metals. So if you get those positive ions, you get a lot of them right. But we still have to talk about the non-metals because you need the non-metals in addition to the metals to get chemistry going. Non-metals gain electrons and they form negative ions. This is the oxygen atom and its electron configuration. Let's draw that out. Be kind to me, because you know I can't draw. We're going to keep the same with our protons in blue. Our neutrons will be in green. And our electrons will be in red. Right now, the oxygen atom has eight protons and eight electrons. That means our charge is zero, it's neutral. Nonmetals gain electrons because they want to fill that sublevel. We've got 2p that's got four electrons and it can hold a total of six. That oxygen says, you know what? I'm not giving up any of these electrons. I've got six of them. I've worked hard. I'm not going to give any up. I'm going to take some. It wants to fill that 2P sublevel. And when it does that, it now has six electrons in the 2p instead of four. What does that look like? Here's our oxygen. We have not changed anything about the protons. There's still eight protons. And the neutrons don't really add anything in terms of the charge, but we should represent them. P 
But now, instead of eight electrons, if you total up the two plus the four plus the six, that's 10 electrons. If we add those two together to figure out the charge, we're now negative. So we've added on two electrons. That means our charge is negative two. So hopefully these sad little drawings will help you visualize what's going on when you're forming a positive ion and a negative ion. Just like with the positive ions, there's a little bit of an easier trick for figuring out the ionic charge of a non-metal. To figure out the charge, you take the group number, the one that has the A behind it, and subtract 8. Oxygen is in group 6, 6A. So its charge, you're going to take that 6 and subtract 8, gives you negative 2. We'll do the same thing that we did with a positive ion with a negative ion. We'll figure out the charge. We'll write the full configuration or the noble gas configuration. And then we'll write the configuration for the ion. Chlorine is in group 7A. It is a non-metal. That means we can figure out its charge by taking the group number, which is 7, subtract 8. That gives us negative 1. So that's our ion. Okay. Now we need to write configurations. We're going to start with just a plain old chlorine atom. If I were to write the noble gas configuration for chlorine, the atom, I'd go up one row. That's neon. We're giving neon a lot of love today. Then you look at the row that chlorine is in. We have to write out all those electrons to get from neon to chlorine. These two, we're looking at the 3s. Then we count. We're in the p's. One, two, three, four, five. If we add one more electron, which is what happens when you make a negative ion, that means that we're going to complete that P sublevel. So if we just add it on to the P's exactly as it is, now we're at the ion. But there's an easier way to write this. 
if I add one more electron, that means that I'm walking one more space over on the periodic table. So if I add one more electron, to chlorine, you end up with the electron configuration for argon, which is the noble gas. When we're looking at these nonmetals, they are going to gain electrons so that the electron configuration of the ion looks like the noble gas in its energy level. So let's write that out. Nonmetals gain electrons and form ions that have the same electron configuration as the noble gas. in their energy level. Chlorine is in N equals three. It's the third row. That means that the chlorine ion looks like the noble gas in N equals three which is argon. Again, we'll practice it. When you practice, it'll make more sense. Right now you're just listening. Maybe you're taking notes. It's not gonna hit right. You'll be like, oh, okay, sure. As you listen to your music and you watch your TV show on Netflix. I know what you're doing. I don't need to be there to know. I know what's going on. But if you come to class and you participate, it will make a lot more sense. Here is a table with some common ionic charges. Not the end all be all, but this will help you and you can check some of your work. So while you're doing your homework, you can refer to this common ionic charges chart and see if, hey, did I get the charge right? Why not use all your resources? One more thing. We're going to put the whole concept of writing these configurations and forming positive and negative ions together. When you have atoms and ions that have the same electron configuration, they're called isoelectronic. So in the previous slide, well, maybe two slides ago, we we're talking about chlorine and argon having the same chlorine ion and argon having the same configuration. They are isoelectronic. Same electron configuration. All of this mixture of ions here all have 18 electrons and are isoelectronic with argon. So you see chlorine is in here. But let's show what that really means. We'll start with phosphorus. We'll do that in black. We said that for a non-metal it's going to gain electrons so that it looks like the noble gas in its same energy level. It's in energy level three. So that means it will look like argon when it forms an ion. Phosphorus is in group 5A. So its charge, which we already see here is 
3 minus, but I want to show you how we got there. The charge, you take the 5, subtract 8, and that gives you the minus 3. Again, the N equals 3 noble gas is equal to argon. So that P3 minus electron configuration, we've confirmed that's going to be argon. But what about this potassium? We'll do that in blue. Potassium is in group 1A. That means that it loses one valence electron and its charge is going to be plus one. So we've got that, great. But what about the noble gas um, configuration? We already said that we can write out the full and then identify the core and what's the valence and then match up. We don't have to do all that. Potassium is equal in N equals four. I told you, you look at the noble gas that comes in the period before your element. So the one above it, N equals four is where potassium is. So the noble gas configuration of the ion will be the noble gas in the row that comes before it. So both of these have the same number of electrons, 18. But one is a positive ion and it's potassium. The other is a negative ion and it's a chlorine ion. Same number of electrons, two very different ions. Hopefully this demonstrates to you one, how to write those noble gas configurations. Two, how to figure out the charges of different ions that are representative elements. And three, what an isoelectronic series is and how you can figure out which, elect which elements are part of an ele isoelectronic series. With practice and time, this will make perfect sense to you. You have to give it the time that it deserves and needs, and I promise you'll get it. Be realistic with your time. If you are not a chemistry major, if this is not super interesting to you, you will not want to devote all the time that may be required for you to get it. I understand that. But if it's something that is interesting to you or you like a challenge, give it a little bit more time than you might want to maybe an extra 30 minutes on top of what you would normally give and see how far that takes you. That's it for this time. I usually have that slide of thanks for watching. Mommy brain, I forgot. So my apologies. But thank you as always. Please attend the lectures and I'll hopefully see you soon.